This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three. The top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of October 8th, 2018. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning, now from 6.20 to 7 a.m., for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we talk about the elephant in the room, the most important fiscal issue this year that none of the candidates are talking about. Second, Governor Walker's former DOR commissioner calls out opponents for lack of truth, but avoids the hard truths about Walker's positions. And third, in our view, the single most important legislative election this cycle. And now, let's join Michael. Brad Keithley comes in every week for the deep dive, getting down into the weeds. It's his weekly top three where we talk about three different issues, stories, or uh, things that will deeply affect the state of Alaska. And uh, he has taken time out from his busy uh, music festival schedule. He's on a he's on a music festival, John, out there. Uh, I think catching all the Celtic music uh, around the uh, around the uh, country. And uh, he's uh, taking the time out to give us a call up this morning and uh, and give us an update. Good morning, sir. How are you doing? Michael, uh, I'm doing great. You're correct. I, I'm out at a Celtic music festival, and I'm smiling most of the time, except when I catch up with the Alaska headlines. So, except, um, <laughs> except when you get the headlines. Yeah, bummer, huh? Well, it's a it's a challenge. Yeah, no, it's uh, when you read what's going on, it's pretty interesting. Now, um, bef- let's see. I, I mean, I want to get right into your top three and talk about those things. Um, but I also want to, uh, I, I do have a question, so I'm trying to decide, I'm trying to decide which direction. I guess we'll just kick things off with the top three first and I will interrupt, uh, in between probably one and two, uh, because I think I've got a, I've got an interesting question that was posed to us this morning on the chat room. And I don't know if you were following along or not, but, uh, we will, uh, we'll get things, we'll get things rolling on that. So let's talk uh, for just a minute here about, uh, you know, kick things off with your weekly top three. It is an important fiscal issue uh, that basically you're saying that nobody is talking about. And I have some helpers and stuff here, some slides up on the uh, uh, on the Facebook feed as well for folks to follow along with. So uh, just let's take it away with number one. Sure. So in in the in the campaign of 2014, the governor, the gubernatorial campaign of 2014, there was an elephant in the room, an issue that nobody talked about. Um, uh, during the course of the campaign that, that ultimately, I think, has determined the last four years. That was the, that was the drop, the fall in oil prices that was going on uh, during the, the 2014 campaign. Neither Parnell nor Walker, I mean, they both sort of, they both sort of campaigned as if, as if it didn't exist. Um, and when we got to the 2014 election and then and then the subsequent four years, we've seen that that drop in the price of oil that was going on during the 2014 election was the issue that really that really controlled the next four years. And it would have been good to have some discussion about that uh, uh, during the campaign. Uh, I, there's a there's a similar issue going on during this campaign, um, and nobody's talking about it. And I think, frankly, it's going to be one of the issues that we're going to have to confront in the next four years. And I wish I wish candidates would talk about it. It is the, the, the need to refill uh, the, the constitutional budget reserve, the savings accounts uh, that we, the fiscal reserve accounts that we have built up over time and now drained uh, during the course of the last four years. Uh, one of the slides you may have up on the, on the screen 
is, is a slide that shows how much of our savings, how much of our fiscal reserves we've used over the last uh, five years, six years, uh, since we got into this situation. We've, we've supported state spending. We've supported the state budget uh, during that period by drawing down nearly $20 billion, $20 billion uh, from our fiscal reserves uh, over the last six years. We would not have made it through uh, this fiscal crisis without having those reserves there. The biggest uh, drawdown, well, the first drawdown we took was from the statutory budget reserve. We've essentially drained it to zero. We took $5 billion from that. Another drawdown that we've made is from the PFD by diverting a portion of the PFD, otherwise to Alaskans, uh, taxing that essentially, converting it over to government. And we've used about $2.4 billion of that to support spending. But the biggest chunk of it has come from the Constitutional Budget Reserve, which, because as it says in its name, is, set, is, is established in the Constitution. And that, we've drawn down about $12 billion of the $14 billion, roughly $14 billion uh, we've had in that account, $12 billion uh, that we've used to support state spending. That, under the constitutional provision, uh, it's, it's contemplated that we pay that back. We fill that up. That is intended to be a reserve tank, a fiscal reserve tank that's right. used during tough economic times and built back up during good economic times. Right. We've about drained it to zero. The question is that the, the, the big elephant in the room is how are we going to fill that back up for the next time? Right. And, and it is, again, it's in the Constitution, and the Constitution says that you will, basically, you, you call it in this graph that graphic that I have up on the uh, screen, uh, the analysis of the cumulative withdrawals, you call it borrowing because, again, we're not just spending it out of the fund. We are borrowing it. There's a requirement that that money be in there for that rainy day or emergency contingency. And so a borrowing, again, implies having to pay back. Yeah, exactly right. And and we've got, I mean, we're, the country is, is, is facing some, some increasing headwinds. Uh, the world economy is facing some increasing headwinds. You're not sure, uh, never sure, when you're, when you're running a government, exactly when you're going to have a fiscal situation arise. So as you, when you pull these down, when you pull your fiscal reserve down in order, to, in order to deal with one situation, you need to fill it back up when you get to the point that you can. Uh, in order to prepare yourself for dealing with the next situation, and we're uh, the, the the thing that we're not that we're not focusing on is we're big in the hole. Twelve billion dollars, we've used that. We've used all twelve billion dollars to get us through the current fiscal crisis. Right, right. It's going to take us a, take us a while to build that back up. Right, unless oil some, somehow mysteriously spikes back up to one hundred and fifty dollars a barrel, which I don't, nobody's predicting any you know any time in the near future, you're not going to see all that money go back in with any kind of rapidity. So when these so when these candidates talk about their fiscal plans, when 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 Senator Dunleavy or uh, 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 former Senator Begich or Governor Walker talk about their fiscal plans, they need to be taking into account the refill of the Constitutional Budget Reserve. That's one of my big issues. I know you had a discussion with Mike last week. I, I listened to it, and we can talk about that. But that's one of my big issues with Mike. He, he talks about budget numbers that would be fine if you didn't have to fill back up the Constitutional Budget Reserve. But we, we do. And even, even if you look at amortizing, at, at repaying that, that $12 billion over a 10-year period, that's still a billion two each year that you need to be putting back into the constitutional budget reserve to prepare for the next time. People say, well, you don't need that much in it. Well, we did. I mean, that we just went through it. Uh, we've just gone through it the last six years. That, that, that is, is more than enough proof that we need to have that money uh, in there. So when, when you say, uh, you know, when Senator Dunleavy used to say, I, I, we can have an operating budget of $4.3 billion, well, that assumes you're not refilling the CBR. When you when you take into account the need to refill the CBR, that 4.3 suddenly becomes 3.5. Right. Um, uh, to, to to by subtracting that out, so um, you need to you need to you need to have uh, money. Uh, you need to be able. You need to be accounting for the refill of the CBR uh, in the in the in the in your fiscal plans. We need to be discussing it in the campaign. Nobody is. 
just like 2014 when we didn't discuss the falling price of oil, we need to be discussing uh, uh, the need to refill the CBR, and, and we're not doing it. But my guess is that's going to be one of the big issues that drives uh, the next term of the governor between 2018 and 2022. And you actually did some analysis on, you know, what is going to be available, the near-term net available spending. And you took a look at this, and unfortunately, they all got minuses in front of them. All the numbers have got minuses in front of them, which means that's not good. Well, no, I did. The minuses are, if, if you've got up that next slide, that what we did was look at the revenues that we anticipate, uh, both from oil and from other revenues. We added in. Uh, Hammond 50-50. Uh, we looked at what the revenues would be available uh, from permanent fund earnings after the PFD to go to to go to government. Added that in, and then we subtracted out uh, the amount that needs to go to the CVR to to refill the CVR uh, and protect for and 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 get ready for uh, the next fiscal situation. Those are minuses because because we've taken money out, so we need to repay it in. It comes out of the money. We have to spend. We need to take those funds, a portion of those funds, and put it back into the CBR refill savings. And once you do that, if you when you look at those numbers, you can see that the number we ought to be talking about for available to spend is in the 3.7, 3.75, 3.8 range. It's not in the in the 4.3 range. So that is that's the number. That's the issue that that I think is going to drive uh, uh, the next four-year term getting the CBR back in shape, doing things that they get the CBR back in shape. And that's the issue that, uh, that I think is just not being talked, uh, not only not enough about, but at all uh, during this campaign. Yes, uh, we're talking with him about his top three. This number one is, of course, the CBR payback, which he's right. Nobody's talking about. Uh, not even... The uh, the guy that is actually the focus of his number two weekly top three, and that is the opinion piece from Randy Hoffbeck in the ADN, which talks uh, about how Governor Walker is the only guy being honest with the numbers, although he's not talking about the CBR payback. Uh, so let's let's dive into that here for a couple minutes, Brad, before we have to take a break. Yeah, Walker Walker wants to make <clears throat> excuse me Walker wants to make this pitch that I'm the one that's been on the front lines. I'm the one that's been honest. I'm the one that's had to confront these numbers. And so, and so you need to, or confront this situation. So you need to, you need to give me credit. You need to reelect me because I've done a good job and I've been on the front lines doing it. And then he has all these people writing opinion pieces that say he's the only one confronting the issues and the only one that's talking honestly about the numbers. He's not, he, uh, he's talking, he's talking about some of the numbers, but he's not talking about the consequences uh, of, of his actions. The PFD cuts have the largest am adverse impact on the overall economy. They have by, are by far the costliest alternatives to Alaska families. They increase poverty levels. They reduce economic activity in the state. Um, and he hasn't talked about any of that. Uh, he, he, he likes to think that, that or he likes to say that I was honest. I, I had a problem. I went, I, I made the hard decision to cut the PFD. Uh, the Senate and I made the hard decision to cut the PFD, and, and so I deserve credit for that. Well, there were a lot of other options out there that you could have handled it. You could have reduced spending. You could have gone to a flat tax. You could have, you could have done other things that would have handled the situation. He picked the option that has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy and is by far the costliest to Alaska families. He, he won't admit that. He won't talk about it. He won't, he won't, he won't contemplate the economic effect on the on the overall economy of, of what he did. He won't talk about what he did uh, to Alaska families. He's not he's being honest about part of the numbers, but he's not being honest about the consequences of his actions. If he were, he would have to fess up and say, look, I picked the wrong option. And if he really wanted to be honest, he would say, I picked the wrong option. I picked the option that was the most harmful and the largest adverse impact to the overall Alaska economy was by far the was by far the costliest to Alaska families, and and increased poverty levels the most. I picked the wrong option. In my next term, I'm going to do better. I'm going to I'm going to work toward what is a better option, has a lower ec economic impact on Alaska, is much better for Alaska families, doesn't protect the top 20% at the expense of the, of the other 80% of, of Alaska income earners. Uh, I'm going to do better. 
he, but he hasn't said that. He's just doubling down on being bad, frankly. Um, he said, I was faced with a tough situation. I made a tough decision, um, and, and I deserve credit for that. Well, he was faced with a tough situation. He made a tough decision, but it was the wrong decision. It had economic consequences. It had consequences for families. It had consequences for poverty, poverty, poverty levels. It had consequences for income gaps. It had consequences for the other 80% of Alaska families. And in none of the op-ed pieces uh, that he or his supporters have done have addressed any of that. They like to hide that away, put it in a box, uh, act as if it doesn't exist. Well, and again, kind of the whole uh, disingenuousness on some of these things like, oh, I cut 40 percent. I did, you know, we eliminated 3,000 positions. I mean, it makes it sound like they fired 3,000 people, uh, you know, when all they did was take a lot of unfunded positions out that shouldn't have been there to begin with. It had been bulking up state government for years. The whole 44 percent number has been debunked uh, over and over and over again. There's a lot of disingenuousness here, but I want to drill down just a little bit more into this. But we got to take a break. We're going to be back with more. Brad Keithley is our guest. Alaskans for Sustainable Budget. The Michael Duke Show. Your home for common sense, liberty-based, free-thinking Alaskan radio. Thanks for coming in. Brad Keithley continues with us now. He is our guest. He is a former oil and gas consultant, uh, attorney, uh, and uh, kind of an economics guy. He gets down into the weeds with us uh, every week to talk about things in the state of Alaska that affect us, including his weekly top three. We were right in the middle of the number two of the weekly top three, which was the discussion on this opinion piece from Randy Hoffbeck, former commissioner of revenue for the state of Alaska under Bill Walker, uh, which was just lauding Bill Walker as being the guy to make all the hard decisions. Oh, the, this is the this is the Peter Machicki selfie moment for the governor where he pats himself on the back, uh, you know, just strenuously about what a great job he did pulling all this together. Uh, when the fact is, of course, as Brad just mentioned before we went to break, he pulled the trigger on the largest uh, lever on government that did the most damage to the private and the economy as a whole. I mean, this you want to talk about why we're still in a recession? Here's a big reason why we're still in a recession. Uh, Brad, and before we went to break, I was just talking about how that 40 40- four percent number that the the governor threw around about how he's cut government 44 percent and how the permanent fund just would never i mean it's just going to dwindle to nothing because we can't that's only of course assuming that they can't control their spending and of course the 44 percent but again this is just all political fiction we see this all the time and quite honestly i think people are starting to get a little tired of it yeah the governor's got a narrative i mean the governor's narrative is i came in i inherited the mess uh, and I had the guts and, and, and made the hard decision to, to fix it. I looked at the numbers. Uh, I figured out what people needed, what we needed in spending. I figured out where we needed to get the money from, and I made, I made the hard decisions. That's, that's his narrative. And, 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 I, and I can't argue, frankly, with the beginning of that, uh, which is I came in and inherited a mess. The, the, the prior administration and the prior legislature had gone on a spending binge uh, that was just, it, just obscene. Uh, in terms of the amount of money they were going through, the programs they were establishing, the the uh, the, the capital budget that, that they were spending, um, and really had put the state in a situation where it wasn't uh, particularly well situated to weather uh, um, uh, a fiscal the fiscal storm that, that came in with uh, with lower oil prices. But but I, so I agree with that part of the narrative. But but the rest of the narrative from then on where which is where I made the hard decisions. They were the right decisions. I decided what, what programs needed to be saved. I, de- I decided where the, where the money needed to come from, which was cutting the PFD, uh, a head tax that had the largest adverse impact on the overall economy and was by far the costliest to Alaska families and increased poverty levels the most of, of any of the options. The rest of that narrative, uh, I think, just fails. I mean, yes, he had a mess. Yes, he didn't need to make decisions, but he made the wrong decisions. From the standpoint uh, of the overall economy, he saved government. Um, those uh, those who were tied to government spending, yeah, he he took care of that sector of the of the economy a little bit, and he frankly saved he, along with the Alaska Senate majority, saved the top twenty percent by adopting PFD cuts uh, as the way to fund government. Uh, he he took less than two percent of the income, less than two percent of the income from the top twenty percent. And took up to 25 percent of the of the income from the other 80 percent um, uh, through a head tax. So yeah, it, it's it's a it's an interesting narrative. One he 
he continually repeats as as his story uh, of how of why he needs to be erect, reelected because he made those hard decisions. He's capable of making those hard decisions. But you don't reelect a guy who made the wrong decisions. You know, you got football coaches out there every week who make who make decisions. I mean, who's going to start at quarterback? Who's going to start it? At wide receiver, are we going to kick or are we going to punt on fourth down? Or are we going to go for it on fourth down? Uh, make those who make those decisions, and yes, they those are hard decisions, and they make them. And the ones who make the wrong decisions get fired uh, because their teams don't win, they don't move forward. Uh, the fans aren't satisfied, the owner isn't satisfied. There isn't there isn't a sense of of success. Right. Bill Walker is the Bill Walker is the football coach. Who, who has started the wrong guy at quarterback, uh, the wrong guy at, at, at wide receiver, who's running the wrong set of plays, who makes the wrong decision on fourth down, who, who doesn't get the team uh, advanced into a, a winning position, who makes the wrong defensive calls. And he doesn't, he, like the football coach who makes those wrong decisions, he doesn't deserve to be retained. We need a new coach to come in uh, and make right decisions and, and get the economy uh, back on track and make the right decisions for the overall Alaska economy, not just the government sector, and for all Alaskans, not just the top 20%. So, yeah, Hoffbeck and, and others can write these articles about, you know, that, that sort of try to lay out the governor's narrative of being of being the right man at the right time. But he he was the man at the time. He just happened to be the wrong man making the wrong decisions, and now we need to move on. And and I know we got to quit this one, but before we go, I have to say that the comment about the PFD, uh, where he's he's touting all the accomplishments, including closing the deficit, credit rating restored, and said, this is my favorite one, which just makes me grip my teeth every time. And every Alaskan will get a PFD that is larger than average and projected to keep growing. Yeah, I would have gotten a much larger PFD. You want to talk about the averages now? What's over the last three years? How much has the average gone up in the last three years when we should have been getting twenty five hundred or three thousand dollar dividends for the last three years? Um, you know, I just again that that thing of well, it's it's larger than the average, so you should be happy. No, no, that's that's yeah. my money. Don't give me a ten and tell me it could have been a hundred, but you know that average was ten, so feel good about it. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's I mean. In his storyline, any PFD is 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 a plus. You know, I, I saved your PFD. Well, as as we've talked about before on the show, the PFD was doing just fine. It was it was the the permanent fund corporation was churning out, was making investments. They were churning out earnings. Uh, it's still making investments. It's still churning out earnings, churning out more and more earnings uh, as the investments uh, proved to be good ones. It was doing just fine. What wasn't doing just fine was the government side due to overspending uh, and, and, and in, a, in an effort to, to bail out government, to bail out those overspending decisions, he made the PFD not, not fine either. So he took something that was doing just fine, leave it alone, let at least one thing work uh, in this government the way it's supposed to work. Uh, and he didn't even do that. He, he, you know, he bled over and, and, and made that uh, uh, problematic as well. So I, it, it's just time to change the football coach. He's called yeah. too many wrong plays, and he's, and he's put in too many wrong players. We're down to the last three or four minutes here, Brad, so I want to jump down into what you said is the most important and pivotal uh, race uh, that, we're, that we're dealing with in the state of Alaska this year. Uh, so let, let's talk about the most important legislative election this cycle. I think I think it all comes down to, frankly, it, it comes down to the governor's race. That's that's certainly critical. But to me, a lot of this is coming down to one particular legislative race, and that's the Senate District O race, uh, the, the the rematch between Peter Machecki and and Ron Gillum. Uh, that was a very close race. Machecki won with with fifty point six percent of the vote. Gillum had forty nine point four percent. Won the primary. Uh, with 50.6 percent of the vote, Gillum with 49.4 uh, uh, percent of the vote. That was just uh, that was with just Republicans in the race, not not were voting in the race, not really independents, um, uh, and not and certainly not not other members of other parties like Libertarians. Um, so I think that I think that deserves a rematch. Gillum is the right-in candidate, uh, and and frankly, I think that is the most critical uh, 
legislative race uh, in the state. Here, here's the deal. If Gillum wins that race, fiscal conservatives, a fiscal conservative block in the Senate has five votes. Mike Schauer, uh, Shelley Hughes, uh, 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 Laura Reinbold, probably David Wilson, and then Ron Gillum. And with five votes uh, in the Senate, they can be the balance of power in the Senate. The Senate can, can, can get to it, can be in a situation where budgets can't go forward, uh, spending plans can't go forward without the approval of that, of that five vote fiscal conservative block. They can, be the, they can be the swing vote, they can control the direction of the Senate. If you have Dunleavy as governor, uh, who's controlling the budget at the front end and at the back end, and if you have that block in the Senate, who can have a huge influence on the budget and PFD decisions um, in the Senate, you can really get some things done from a fiscal policy standpoint. If we don't have that fiscal conservative block, we go back to the old Senate majority, which frankly is the Senate majority that, that, that led Walker, was, was, was before Walker in terms of cutting the PFD. The Senate passed a bill to cut the PFD before Walker did it by veto. The, the, that, they're that, the Senate majority that continued spending, the Senate majority that, that hasn't made the tough decisions on, on, on where spending reductions need to be. If we don't get that conservative block, that's where we end up. Ron Gillum can change it. And frankly, I think that's the most critical legislative race we've got in the state this session or this time. If you're down on the peninsula, you just heard it right there, folks. Ron Gillum, right in. That's what Brad Keithley saying, the most important race. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budget. Thank you, my friend, for coming in and joining us today. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Back with more. Don't go anywhere. We're going to talk with Brad here, finish things up. But we'll be back with more right after these messages. Streaming live every weekday morning on Facebook Live and MichaelDukesShow.com. All right, we are in the break. Brad, thanks so much. Uh, we didn't get to this because we got so this man that two segments there. So we really need to do another podcast. Um, I mean, we just need to sit down and do the deep dive for an hour again, and then uh, all the Patreon listeners will be happy as well because we'll have something that we can give them good early access to. Um, all right, um, one final thought though, and, and I think this is interesting. We discussed this right at the beginning of the show. William said. Uh, he said, you know, what's Brad's thoughts on this? And he posts a link to the um, to the debate at the Wendy Williamson Auditorium at UAA. And it's a debate uh, with only Baggage Walker and Toyin, the Libertarian candidate, showing up. Dunleavy is not participating. I think that's a very strategic maneuver on his part uh, because literally it's a 2v1 uh, they have nothing to lose uh, and everything to gain by basically, you know, tag teaming him and in you know, working him into a corner on something. And so I think with his lead, this is very similar to him not talking about specific cuts. I think that he is uh, I think he's strategically trying to just avoid those kind of, uh, uh, you know, traps or corners. Um, is, is that your take on it? And do you think that that will work for him? Well, I, yeah, I, I, I think that is what they're doing. I, I mean, somebody's referred to that as running the clock out, the election clock out, with, you know, without making a stumble. I, I think that is exactly uh, what the campaign's doing uh, in this situation, in the situation of the other debates, and uh, and with not coming up with a, a more definitive fiscal plan. And and from a from a political strategy standpoint, um, I understand that. Here here here's my concern about it, though. Elections, campaigns are an opportunity not only to define yourself and to get support and to win the election, it's also an opportunity to get a mandate uh, in order to, to take certain actions. Um, and it's an opportunity to educate uh, citizens on issues and, and help them understand and be supportive of the actions that you're going to need to take uh, uh, some some fairly drastic actions after you get elected. Um, that's frankly one of the one of the problems I have with not talking about the CBR. We're going to have to make some fairly we're, we're going to have to 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 make some budget cuts in other places in order to be able to pay back uh, the CBR and prepare the state for the next uh, fiscal situation. And we ought to be talking about that in this campaign. This this particular debate at UAA is focused entirely on the PFD. That's, that's the one issue that the debate's about. It's an hour-and-a-half debate. Um, it's being conducted professionally by 
uh, Steve Johnson of the UAA Debate uh, Department, chair of the UAA Deba Debate Department. Uh, it's, it's an excellent opportunity to have a very good discussion about, uh, about the PFD to, to help educate people on the PFD and to help build a mandate for the steps that are going to need to be taken uh, with respect to the PFD. If, if I were Dunleavy, if I were running for governor, I'd be at that debate uh, for, for those reasons. Uh, to, to use it as an educational opportunity and to, and to use it to help build a mandate. Um, uh, I'm, not, I'm not running for governor, so and, and maybe if I ran for governor and did that thing, I'd lose um, because I wasn't employing the right campaign strategy. But, it's, but we're losing an opportunity in this campaign uh, uh, as Mike skips these debates, and, and, I, and I can appreciate why, but as Mike skips these debates and skips uh, a deeper dive down into fiscal policy. We're losing an opportunity in this campaign to educate citizens uh, on, on, on the situation we face and the alternatives we have to deal with it. And we're losing an opportunity for the governor to build a mandate that, frankly, he's going to need as he gets into office and makes some of these hard decisions. What about the dangers, though, that I, that I, I did speak about? And, and I agree with you. I think I would like to see uh, him at, at a couple more debates. I understand why they're doing it. What do you think of that danger, though? Because I do get concerned that, I mean, again, this is the, you know, they could tag him. They've got nothing to lose at this point, uh, but to work him in the corner and make him look bad, um, I, you know, and, and, and I, that does concern me a little bit. Yeah, and and it's a it's a fair point. And in other debates, you know, con conducted by forums that don't necessarily share Dunleavy's perspective, uh, I think that's a real danger. This debate, uh, in particular, though, I've been in debates that have been have been chaired by Steve Johnson, uh, and and been conducted by Steve Johnson, and they have always been extremely fair, uh, and they've always uh, they've always uh, he's always cut off people who have tried to. You know, go down spurious roads, uh, and he's always been very fair in giving everybody time to, to, to say their piece. So, yeah, I, under, I understand that issue, and and I and I agree with it. Frankly, in some of the forums uh, that have held debates that, that that Mike has skipped, this particular forum, as I say, if it were me, I would be there. Uh, this particular forum, I think, will be a very fair forum, uh, and I think will be conducted very fairly. Uh, and and I think you know I, I think Mike's got a good has got a good pitch. He's got he, the, the PFD is the right thing to be to be standing on. The the, the economic arguments you've got with the PFD are the are the right things to be making. Um, and I think he's got a good pitch, and I think he would have good answers to whatever uh, baggage and uh, and Walker throw up. And I think there I think he could make the point that you know Walker's not made hard choices. He's made soft choices that have helped the top twenty percent. And help those with the tied to government income, but at the expense of the other 80 percent of Alaskans and the expense of the overall Alaskan economy. I think he would have good, a good ability to push back on Walker. So, yeah, yeah. I, I understand the issue. I understand the concern. I just this one, this particular forum, I uh, I, I I wouldn't think uh, I I wouldn't have that concern if it were me. Limited uh, scope, I think you might be right, but uh, we're going to have to leave it there. Brad Keithley, thanks so much for coming on board and joining us today, my friend. I appreciate it. Michael, thanks as always for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.